on today's World Insight with Tian Wei. Former World Bank Chief Economist Justin Lin charts the rise of China and how it can overcome the latest barrage of tariffs from the U.S. The Summer Davos Forum opens in the city of Tianjin. That forum attempts to test the relationship between innovative societies and the fourth industrial revolution. You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. The rise of unilateralism and protectionism in recent years has resulted in geopolitical conflicts like the ongoing trade war between China and the United States. In theory, trade globalization can benefit all nations on Earth, and evidence from the past also supported this view. But why does deglobalization appear to be gaining momentum, at least in some corners of the world? What is wrong then, and how can the world economy get back on track? Escalating trade tensions. After a glimmer of hope appeared in de escalating the U.S. China trade conflict, U.S. President Donald Trump once again brought out heavy ordinance, imposing 10% tariffs later this month on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods. Those will eventually go up to 25% at the end of the year. China has announced that it will impose tariffs on $60 billion worth of American products. The taxes, ranging from 5 to 10 percent, will cover thousands of products and go into effect Monday. China's foreign ministry insists negotiations are the only way to solve these trade issues. China reiterates that carrying out dialogue and negotiations based on equality, good faith and mutual respect is the only right way to solve the China-U.S. economic and trade issues. However, what the U.S. is doing now does not show sincerity or goodwill. And China's Commerce Ministry is also demanding Washington change its policies, saying the new tariffs will only hurt trade talks. The trade frictions are never just a China-U.S. issue. It concerns all who participate in the global trading system. Professor Justin Lin, as former World Bank Chief Economist and Director of the Center for New Structural Economies at Peking University, shared with us his insights on China-U.S. trade ties. Professor Lin, welcome to CGTN. Good morning, Wei. One of the things people are asking is about the global supply chain. Where is China going to be as a result of this apparent trade war between China and the United States on the global supply chain? Well, certainly I hope trade war will be over soon because trade is always a win-win for every country. The trade world currently what we observe will affect the kind of process and especially China is a major producer of manufacturing goods in the world so China get a nickname of the world factory and uh, this kind of modern manufacturing rely on supply chain so if this trade war prolonged certainly it will hurt a little bit but China is a large country so the impact will be there but I think it will be observable. Mm. I know, Professor Lin, you are a believer of globalization, but when you are saying you hope the trade war would end soon, is there any evidence that could help us to understand that the trend is really going there or the other way around? And I think that as we said, we hope for the best, but we prepare for the worst. How is China prepared for the worst? Well, certainly China has a lot of uh, domestic you know, demand and uh, we can rely on domestic demand to absorb some of this you know, diversion. And uh, China also trade with European country, Africa, South Asia, Central Asia, East Asia. And uh, so you know, the world is only between China and the US, but we have so many friends in the world. Mm. And uh, we can, you know, work together to arrange, you know, uh, globalization 
even without the participation of the U.S. The trade war, when it comes to the amount or the quantity, is one thing. But the most important thing is what's going to be the nature of the relationship between China and the United States, the two largest economies in the right. world. And therefore, what does it mean for the world economy as a whole? Meanwhile, it is also about confidence. The confidence believing in globalization, the confidence about the global economy in the future. Yeah. About that part, is there any evidence, Professor Lian, helping us to understand where things are going? I think that uh, because we need to see the foundation of relation. The foundation of relation is that where this relation help each other, improve the living of the people in both country and uh, fulfill the dream of the people in both country. And uh, I strongly believe, yes, that's the foundation. Our productions, our industries, are in the low, medium, value-added sectors. Yes. And the U.S. is on the high-value and uh, added sectors. And so our economy comes to complementarity. That means we, you know, in a trade, we export you know, low prices, deep necessity, consumption good to help the consumers. Trade is still a win-win because in uh, the mechanism of trade, when countries are on a different income level, okay. they're based on the different competitive advantages. China has competitive advantage in multiple intensive sectors, and the U.S. has competitive advantage on higher value added capital intensive sectors. But when our income reaches the same level, then trade will rely on specialization. So trade will always be good for everyone. And that is the reason why globalization has been a trend in the world. Mm. And uh, that allows that every country to have an opportunity to improve the efficiency of their economy and, diff and uh, you know, update the different standards of their people. We understand there are certain concerns, let's just say, in Washington about this, what they consider as the so-called imbalance, not just imbalance of trade, but rather imbalance of the overall relationship uh, literally meaning in a way that China should never be able to whether challenge or be in an equal amount when it comes to economic power with the United States, not to mention surpass the United States. I understand, Professor Lin, China said it very clear, we're not here to compete against anyone. But the question is, when China is developing and we see discomfort in some other places as a result of purely China's development. What can China do, really? If China grow, China's market will be larger, and China also provide the opportunity for other countries to share this kind of prosperity, because we are in a globalized world. Certainly, with the rising of China's economy, we will export and more we will upgrade our export to higher value added. That is the foundation for us to have high income. Mm. But at the same time, we will also open the space for low income country either to kickstart their industrialization process so they can transform from a low income agrarian economy to a dynamic growing you know, industrialized economy. China will also, you know, create a space of demand for natural resources, and we know quite a number of uh, uh, developing countries, or even high-income countries like Australia, Canada, they are resources abundant country, right. and China will provide a market for them. And uh, for U.S. or some European countries like Germany and so on, when China grow, China demand for high value added, sophisticated manufacturing good will also increase. Mm -hmm. China's you know, demand for luxury consumption good will be increased. So from what I see, you know, the rise of China, or the growth of China, certainly first, it's a legitimate you know, right for Chinese people. Certainly, it's also a legitimate right for the people in every country. Mm. And in a globalized world, this kind of dynamic growth in one country not only help 
the country itself, but we also help the other country to have larger markets and uh, to grow together. Mm. So I think we should that uh, people understand it's our common interest, and uh, so you know we can join hands to share this pr pr prosperity together. Mm. Robert Zolik, who you used to work with when you were serving for the uh, World Bank, yeah. was suggesting that we should look beyond the current administration in Washington and look at the real nature no. of the economies between the two countries no. and the nature of relationship between the two countries. No. Professor Lian, no. how can we look beyond when you have quite an obstacle right here? What kind of vision does it take for Chinese economic policy makers and academics such as you which is leading the thoughts about China's development here in this country. I think that if, that's a very good point. We should not overreact to you know, the Trump daily, administration's the right, daily, yeah. and the daily issues. Yeah. Because the relation should be long term. And uh, fundamentally, you know, we should do what we need to do to further reforming our economy, to improve the our system and as so often you know we become higher income country we all have a good foundation good institution for you know operation of our system to meet the aspiration of the people yes i think that's a fundamental thing no matter what kind of situation happen you know outside china we should not you know slow down what we need to do. When it comes to China, the biggest challenge is not coming from outside China, but rather how China upgrades itself. Right. So that comes to the reform and opening up issue. Yeah. Professor Lian, you've been instrumental in pushing forward China's reform and interaction with the rest of the world. But Professor Lian, there have been complaints about China not necessarily acting fast not necessarily acting according to its promises over the years, particularly when it comes to the opening part. Um, what do you say, Professor? I think that we need to... What can be done? You know, you know we need, should not you know, judge uh, the reform programs according to some kind of blueprint based on textbook, mm -hmm. right? Because certainly China adopt, adopted a gradual piecemeal approach mm -hmm. for the transition. And uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, the idea of transition from a planned economy to a market economy is to adopt some kind of comprehensive uh, shock therapy to remove all the distortions yes. simultaneously. And at that time, there seemed to be a consensus among the policy and the academic, academic circles in the world. And at that time, the idea that to have a piecemeal gradual approach was the worst possible approach. But uh, that, let's see the evidence. Country adopt those kind of comprehensive shock therapy, try to do privatization, marketization, stabilization, liberalization simultaneously. On the paper, they seem to you know, introduce the perfect institution, perfect mm. system. Yes. But their economy collapsed, stagnant, hit by crisis all the time. And their economic performance measured by the average annual growth rate, it was lower than pre-transition. If you measure by the frequencies of crises, again, it was higher than the pre-transition. Uh, pre yes. And so, those kind of so-called improved uh, you know, institution simultaneously to reach the higher level, it did not contribute to the well-being of the people. And China adopted this kind of gradual piecemeal approach. You know, on the one hand, continue to provide some transitory protection and subsidy to the older capital intensive sector, which when again China's comparable advantages. Mm -hmm. By that, China maintains stability. But on the other hand, also liberalize the entry to the new labor intensive sectors, which China you know, had comparable advantages. And uh, 
government facilitate that by improving infrastructure based environment in the special economic zone, export processing zone. So quickly turn those kind of competitive advantage to competitive advantage. That's right. So China can grow so fast. And not only so, the dynamic growth in the new sectors also create a condition mm -hmm. to reform the older sectors. Because the reason why the older sector require protection and subsidies was because they win against China's comparative advantage. At that time, China was a low-income country, capital was scarce, but they were in a very capital uh, intensive sectors. That's right. And they are not viable in an open competitive market. But after 40 years of reform, China now is a high middle income country, capital is not scarce anymore, and uh, sectors which used to be against China's comparative advantage now become China's comparative advantages. But then that means we could do it faster? Uh, well, Professor? that has to see because, you know, if we can do faster, certainly it will be desirable. But stability is always the foundation. One of the things people are concerned these days is what's going to happen to the international system. Yeah. You yourself worked in the World Bank for yeah. consecutive years. When the developed economy, particularly the United States under the current administration, expressing so much suspicions, and even intention to withdraw from some of the international institutions. What can China, as the biggest developing country in the emerging economy, together with the others, do about the current reality? Can China and some of the others figure out some kinds of solutions in order to make sure that people still have confidence in the international system and confidence in our global economy, Professor? Well, I think that's a very important issue. As I say, globalization is a win-win for everyone. And after the Second World War, the international architectures, you know, is, has paved the foundation for globalization. And I think the challenge is not globalization is not good. Hmm. The challenge is that China you know, benefit from this globalization, China grow very fast, and uh, now the weight in the global economy shift. And, uh, but if we turn away from globalization, other developing countries, they will you know, lose the opportunity to have a dynamic economic growth as China. And uh, so I think the globalization and the international architecture after the Second World War provide a possibility for that. Yeah. And especially, you know, with now China become a newcomer in global development community, provide a system to other developing countries in order to enable them to capture the opportunity of, you know, globalization. I think the globalization is, you know, a platform for every country to develop their economy according to their competitive advantages and by that they can be efficient. Mm. At the same time, it also provides an opportunity for country to transform from poor agrarian economy to modern industrialized economy and a crime the industrial leader to, you know, move from low income, middle income to high income. Mm -hmm. And in this process, for a low income country, two things are crucial. One is to capture the window of opportunity of global relocation of labor intensive manufacturing. Yes. And the second one is to you know create enabling condition for country to capture that opportunities. And in this, you know, entering to this new era, China will become a high income country, China will lose comparative advantages in traditional labor intensive sectors and uh, those kind of sectors will be uh, on the process to be relocated to other countries. Mm -hmm. And because China is a large country, right. China has 85 million you know, job opportunity in those kind of sectors. And that 85 million will be almost possible to make all the low income country to kickstart their industrialization simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But the mining country is infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to have your goods to reach global markets, you need their power, you need their role, you need their port facility. And China's 
bear and roll initiative will you know contribute to the infrastructure connectivities. So I think that uh, you know the developing countries should work together to you know capture this opportunity. And uh, if the developing country can grow faster, they will become the larger market for high income country. Right. And that will enable high income country to continue to maintain higher growth and achieve you know, further prosperity. Even if that means more disputes at the WTO, even the deadlock at the WTO, even that means World Bank, IMF, express concerns or suspicions about China's goals when it comes to future development through the globalization. China is still going to stick to its version of globalization. Is Certainly. that what you're saying? Certainly. Yeah. As simple as that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor okay. Lin, for being with us. Okay. Really appreciate it. Still to come on Road Insight with Tian Wei. The Summer Davos Forum opens in the city of Tianjin. That forum attempts to test the relationship between innovative societies and the fourth industrial revolution. Davos in Tianjin this year is dealing with the topic shaping innovative societies in the fourth industrial revolution. During the meeting, policymakers and business leaders will primarily focus on topics such as creating opportunities for developing countries to leap forward with revolutionary technologies, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, while mitigating potential risks associated with them. More than 2,000 participants from over 100 countries are taking part in this three-day summer Davos in Tianjin. The theme of this year's meeting is Shaping Innovative Societies in the Fourth Industrial Revolution. It's a transformation powered by new technologies, including artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, and gene editing. It's already impacting societies, economies, and geopolitical landscapes. At the opening ceremony, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang stressed the significance of this new industrial revolution. A new round of industrial revolution has come into being in the age of globalization. We have gone through several rounds of industrial revolutions, and they have all boosted the globalization of trade. And this new round of industrial revolution has come into being against the backdrop of globalization at a time when mankind is facing new challenges and has to come up with new wisdom to respond to these new challenges. 2018 marks the 40th anniversary of China's reform and opening up. Premier Li once again insisted that China will continue to deepen reform and open the economy. For more discussion on this year's Summer Davos Forum, we are joined in our Beijing studio, Liu Bao, Cheng the Dean from the Center for International Business Ethics from the University of International Business and Economics. And also in Hong Kong, we have Edward Xie, who is the chairman and CEO of Gaofeng Advisory Company in New York. We are joined by Max Wolf, professor of economics with New School University. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. The fourth industrial revolution, Professor Wolf, of course, that has been a key phrase being repeated once and again. But the question really is, do we really know the meaning of it? Is it really likely to be a real industrial revolution? I think we do know it really is revolutionary. Uh, after all, the definitive phrase of this epic is disruption, and disruption is at least the miniature format of revolution. I suppose you have to disrupt something a certain number of times to get it to revolve fully 360 degrees. But I think we know that our lives, our wealth, our communication, our archival base of knowledge has been digitized, 
has been distributed by and across the mobile web and maybe even moving into blockchain. So I think it's fair to say that at this point we are in the midst of a fourth industrial revolution, mm -hmm. even though we have no idea what the full consequence or net impact will be uh. because we're still right, right sort of in smack in the middle of this process. Uh, Professor Liu, dominance of technologies, of course, uh, is a huge topic these days. Uh, the one that is really grasping the fundamental technologies are really the one that is going to say a word and shakes the world, in fact. Uh, but how do you see this apparent prosperity among economies around the world and the fundamental strength of economy vis-a-vis -vis its relations with some of the most important technologies in the world? Yes, the, uh, it is really those forward-looking technologies uh, which uh, is also termed as emerging industries that are really going to dominate the uh, productivity and also now with the help of the internet or internet of things with artificial intelligence, uh, the, you know, you are really weaving a big web uh, where, you know, whether you are really fishing or whether you are being fished. So that's really make a lot of difference. And that's going to create a tremendous amount of change in terms of wealth distribu uh, distribution mm -hmm. and also uh, power distribution uh, between different uh, circles of the classes and also between even different nations. Mm. Uh, but, you know, having said all of this, uh, Professor Wolf, we have seen some technologies have been overplayed uh, over the past few years. Let's just say VR. You can see the frequency of using those phrase earlier was much more than what it is today. Obviously, today it's more about AI, artificial intelligence, and it is nothing secretive, in fact, about artificial intelligence because it has enjoyed its ups and downs over the past five decades. So uh, what we are having probably is only one of those stages in its development. Uh, and yet there are so many myths and uh, also a fascination about this technology. Uh, once again, my question to you is, when are we going to be grounded about applications of technologies, about really what technologies can create the real world? Yeah, so we've gotten into an unfortunate cycle, and I think really became very pronounced around the turn of the millennium, so around the year 2000, in which the hype cycle on new technology is so large that it's almost guaranteed to be later than we expected and almost disappointing or, or a little bit anticlimactic when it arrives. That being said, I think eventually these things really do smack into the way we live our lives and make profound changes. So if, if we can think back to uh, 18 years ago, basically now, to the first big tech bubble, Basically, there was this uh, notion that everybody was going to do everything on a smartphone or a cell phone at the time. We didn't even have the phrase smartphone, and that was considered kind of crazy. But then by 2007, a few years after the first tech wreck, we got the iPhone and we started getting the Samsung products and all these smartphones, and all of a sudden that futuristic crazy talk from 1999 was an everyday reality in 2009. So mm -hmm. the cycle from hype, which is a real problem, to reality has gone from decades to, to, in some cases, months. And I do think we have had the change, but I think the truth is technology doesn't solve social problems. Mm -hmm. Concerted effort does, and we've tr gotten to a bad habit of hoping our technologies will solve our inequality and our climate change and, and our democracy no. and other issues mm -hmm. around the world, and it doesn't work, right? right? So technology is a potential way to enhance productivity. It doesn't solve social problems. That's right, but on the other hand, uh, uh, Mr. Shea, we see platform economies. You remember those, that has been the phrase that's mentioned by many. And yet we have seen some of those are really running into problems. Facebook, for example, Uber, for example, you have some equivalent of that in China as well and some of the other economies. Big question marks about whether these formats are really likely to work. In the events of technology, there's always some trial and errors, right? So in some cases, advances will be made and in some cases perhaps you run into some problem. It's just the nature when the t new technology is being introduced in the commercial application. Uh, we're going to see more collaboration. We're going to need people or companies to work with other companies or people in order to construct even more, uh, more innovations. So ecosystem of platform, in my view, will further manifest themselves mm. uh, in the future with the, with the new way uh, of technology. Professor Liu, your thought? Uh, the, uh, having said that, the technology is really uh, calling for decentralization of uh, power 
but in the meantime, further integrity uh, uh, in the same place. So coordination around the globe and also it's going to reshape the entire uh, global supply chain. So uh, uh, whether that's going to pass number one ethical test, the other is really the practical test or economic test. So uh, a lot of the newborn uh, born stuff are really uh, there to, uh, you know, to take some time yeah. for people to talk about and then to approve that is going to really contribute to the real well-being of human society. But Professor Wolf, it is well known that on the one hand you got technologies that are supposed to transcend borders, on the other hand you got protectionism running high in some countries including the United States and you want to have a I mean, your president wants to have a wall even built between uh, Mexico and the United States. I want to have tariffs, which has been the tool used decades ago uh, between economies. So how do you think this conflict between the apparent technological liftoff of the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the coming back of some of the old ideas of prote uh, protectionism? Great moments of progress always encounter opponents of progress. There are always people who are terrified or fear that the old order will be washed away by the new capability and that they will be washed away with the, the old order, right? So there are always forces that oppose the progress of history. So in each effort, each great sort of step forward, there ha have always been those who tried to hold back, pull back, mm -hmm. or push back. Um, and that can be quite, quite a problem. And I think we see that again here, which is the world is being reshaped by new technologies and new patterns of trade and right. new areas of wealth and power. And there are folks who, who fear that change and oppose it. Sadly, the U.S. president and some around him may be one of those folks right now. But I think the, the basic momentum for change ultimately wins. Well, it's easier said than done, isn't it, Professor Wolf? I mean, if you look at history, everything seems so simple. Just a piece of fact and yet it was through enormous amount of struggle and zigzagging eventually things happened and therefore uh, Professor Wolf do you think there's likely to be an in a way a utmost battle uh, in the very near or immediate future that we're likely to see the conflict between technologies or technology that has to transcend borders and protectionism. What is likely so, to be uh, and how can we prepare if there's any way to do that? So it's a great question. I think sadly the battle has, has already begun, yes. right? I think probably been mm -hmm. raging and a little bit for a while and very intensely for over a year or so now. I, I do think that the forces and the institutions and individuals and the centers that are pushing forward for an even more integrated, even more open world uh -huh. will probably win, but it will, it's, never, it's never guaranteed and it's hard. There's a, a great quote from Martin Luther King, an uh, American leader here, uh, that the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. The arc of the world economy is also long, and it bends toward progress, but it's a slow bend and it can be an arduous long path. Mm. Mr. Xie, are you ready for that slow bend? and arduous task? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm a little bit more optimistic. I, I believe that you know, the fourth industrial revolution is actually based on technology that will transcend national borders and therefore is actually catering for uh, the, the parts of the world which will really want to go for more globalization and multilateralism. Uh, I believe that you know whoever country who want to sort of be protect you know single lateralism uh, is gonna is gonna close themselves off to the rest of the world and therefore will not benefit from the economic or a technological advance uh, that we'll be seeing in the next generation. Right. So um, I think logic you know the forces the logic would say is going to sway the world back to hopefully a more globalized world. I uh, see. Professor Liu, on the other hand, you do see some economies are taking advantage of the latest development. The mobile pay you mentioned earlier, Professor Liu, of course, is a good example. Many of the developing and emerging economies are having this opportunity to so-called leapfrog, but the possibility of doing the leapfrog vis-a-vis -vis the securities that economies has to guarantee in order to enjoy this leapfrog at the same time is also a crucial issue. 
Absolutely, uh, because uh, this fourth uh, industrial revolution is really a far more complex uh, system as uh, compared with the previous one. So it needs, uh, you know, the uh, precise design and also uh, better collaboration, uh, not on, which cannot really be realized even within one single country. So uh, therefore, uh, the uh, the challenge there whether uh, you know those uh, developing countries they are. Uh, you know, seeing this, uh, but whether they, they are ready, have, have they really done the right type of homework? Uh, China is really moving very fast. We are talking about the 5G technology. We talk mm -hmm. about AI, uh, the uh, big data, etc. But we still have to be very cautious when we come back to the uh, ZTE case. We realize that we have, haven't done a very solid fundamental work uh, dealing with the chips. So therefore, it really requires forward-looking but also practical steps. Mm. Professor Wolf, it seems that uh, Mr. Xie is trying to suggest on the one hand, we're still not really taking great advantage of the technologies available for the possible future education. On the other hand, there is a lacking behind the so-called educational system we're having right now and the way we teach, the way we learn compared to where the technologies is already leading to us. Uh, obviously, it takes a lot of work, but we didn't, didn't see much hope at all. So the question really is, uh, who will be the winner as a result? Or we are all going to be losers eventually? I do think there's a bit of a particular clash uh, as someone who works in the education business as well, which is part of what's made for an elite education and part of what educators and education administrators have prided themselves on is adherence to tradition. And I think in moments of particularly radical and extensive change, like in the fourth industrial revolution, that very sort of tradition and adherence to tradition, which is part of higher education and education, needs to be relaxed and so that education can be not just doing what it thinks is good, but doing what really helps build the society, mm. both in terms of new productivity, but also keep the social bonds strong enough that the society doesn't collapse because social collapse undermines productivity gains pretty quickly. Mm. You argue about the educational system should be much more quote unquote relaxed, but some wonder whether the legal system should also be more relaxed or further uh, adjusted. Uh, Professor Leo, here is an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, on the one hand, the legal system is not capable to handle with the latest development related to technologies. On the other hand, you also see that some kinds of uh, adjustment to the legal system, some wonder whether it's leaving enough space for the new economies to take off, for them to be able to test the thoughts, as they say. Professor Leo, always a delicate balance. You know, uh, we have to know whether, you know, the technology uh, where it is generic, uh, de uh, when it's really generic, whether they are being used in an ethical manner. So that really, uh, you know, invites the law into the place to, uh, to sanction certain behavior. For example, the protection of uh, privacy is taking on a new paradigm. It seems that every one of you gentlemen tonight has become a philosopher in a way. <laughs> Mr. Xie, what about that? How much can you bear about the steps backward before the step forward takes place? Well, I agree with the assessment of Professor Wolf. I, I think, you know, as we try to advance the technology, you know, there's some, some areas that we have to take a step backward, but at the same time, the logic or the vitality of sort of technological advances, in my view, will ultimately make more sense because, you know, we need to make progresses and technology is going to, you know, help us to do that. So whatever artificial barriers that will be erected in the meantime, you know, some of them will be barriers, mm -hmm. but many of them will not become barriers. So overall speaking, I think I agree, you know, we're probably going to take some backwards a little bit, but at the same time, we're going to make big strides going forward in some other ways. So overall <laughs> speaking, I think we're going to see a lot of progress. Okay, before we go, final question for every one of you. If there's anything about the fourth industrial revolution that you are looking for, what exactly is it? Not being a philosopher, but rather being a person in the society, what exactly are you thinking? Professor Wolf, you go first. Yeah, I'm looking for an international governance on cyber policy okay. and rights online because I don't think single nation states can do that very well. All right, Mr. Xie? 
I'm hoping that uh, technology is going to, you know, help us to have a better life, in particular, perhaps, in uh, extending the human uh, lifetime, but also, mm. in particular, in, in improving our health standards. Last but not least, Professor Liu, your wish, though. Well, I wish that the combination of information together with biotechnology can uh, uh, extend your life expectancy and also to raise the quality of life for everybody. Oh, it seems that we all want longevity, gentlemen. Well, thank you so much for the three <laughs> of you for being with us. I really appreciate it. Liu Baocheng, Edward Xie, and Max Wolf. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From Tian Wei and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world.